Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the futureeconomy.ca. Today, uh, our panel is called Canada's Electricity Workforce Adapting for the Future. So we have a great panel today, and I'm excited to introduce to you Adrian Thomas, Country President at Schneider Electric Canada, Kevin Weaver, Vice President Academic at Georgian College, and Roberta Haikawi, at Assistant Business Manager uh, of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So we'll be st starting in a few seconds, but I just want to do a shout out and a thank you to EHRC, Electricity Human Resources Canada, who is sponsoring this whole series, this panel, as well as everything else we're doing uh, around that topic. So make sure to tune in and check out the rest of the content on the website. So we're going to get right into it. Um, so yeah, stay tuned with us. We have four topics today. And at the end, we'll have calls to action. So really worth staying till the end uh, to hear what our uh, esteemed panelists have to uh, call on to or, or you know, sort of uh, uh, share their vision, basically, for Canada's future economy, which is what we at thefutureeconomy.ca are all about. So our first topic today is forces shaping the electricity industry. So sort of the, the bigger picture or perhaps the context uh, for this conversation. Um, and basically, I'm going to start with Adrian, and I'm going to ask you, Adrian, uh, what are the main forces that are sort of driving Canada's electricity industry globally, regionally? Yeah, what are those big issues um, you would put forward? Great. Thank, thanks, Flo. I, I think first and foremost, what we see at a society level is this concern over climate change. And this is certainly driving a lot of focus around decarbonization. Um, we see this in terms of uh, uh, government policies like the Canadian uh, pan-Canadian framework. And we're also seeing this being driven through a lot of consumer behaviors. In terms of electricity, what this means is there's a focus on decarbonizing our electrical generation. And this is driving more and more renewables to be put into our grid ecosystem. So uh, that's, that's the first driver. The second driver is our lives, as, as you know it, as we've all felt over the last 12 months, has become uber digital. Everything today is, is happening online or digital, whether it's uh, communications like we're having here, or it's how we're operating and running our plants through the explosion of IoT and bringing that data back so that we can operate more efficiently. Everything that we're doing digital is going to require more electricity, more energy to make that work. And then the last thing is we're, we're seeing this remote everywhere concept. So um, how we operate um, our facilities and our buildings in a remote way. And that's going to shift. All three of these are going to shift in, in a few ways. It's going to drive huge demand for the labor force in, into this market so we can install, uh, commission, and maintain this equipment. It's going to shift some of the skills we need. Everyone's going to need to be digital literate to start using this equipment. And it's going to shift some of the, the skill sets that we need. It's going to create new opportunities for things in the electricity industry that was uh, more software design and AI and data analysts, things that which previously hadn't really thought so much in terms of the electrical industry. So those, those are what I see as being some of the three dominant trends uh, in, in the electricity um, industry happening right now. Very useful and very useful, of course, coming from the leader of a global company who has, you know, sort of uh, eyes and, and inputs from from all around the world. I'd love to hear, Roberta, on that from your perspective. Obviously, you represent uh, workers in the sector. Um, what are the, some of the things that you think are, are most important to focus on? Thanks, Flo. Uh, well, I, I believe the main drivers are the prevailing environmental concerns as well as changes in how we consume. Um, for example, the pandemic has caused everyone to conduct business differently. Uh, not only in our, our workplaces, but also in our personal lives, um, how we shop, eat, and communicate in general. So we need to think about how to move to the greener technologies, um, energy sources, hybrid or full electric vehicles, and how these things are shaping the power grid. Um, there's a movement away from coal-fired power plants, which means retooling or rethinking of different ways to generate that power. The power plants are being reshaped, but people are starting to look at other means individually as well. We're seeing solar panels being installed in both businesses and residential environments. And this has an impact on the power grid in relation to consumption, but also metering, um, 
power feedback, unstable loads, ownership, more contractors and um, more flexibility in the interconnection. Uh, and over time, governments have put more occupational health and safety guidelines in place and regulatory bodies are constantly monitoring and enforcing the rules that govern utility companies. So these things all impact how work is completed, uh, when work is completed, who is doing the work and how they're trained and certified and so on. So that's what I see. Super, super interesting. Thank you for sharing this. And before turning to Kevin, I want to ask uh, Adrian a bit of a follow up. Uh, obviously, climate change is often what people will cite as the main mega trend that is shaping, frankly, the whole economy, but of course, especially the electricity or the energy sectors. Um, what would you say is the momentum right now around renewable power and electrification, since that's really the name of the game, uh, and the impacts it is having on Canada's electricity workforce? Yeah, I, th I think Roberta brought up some great points in terms of where some of the shifts are and some of the impacts. And I, I think it's worthwhile repeating that this, this shift in terms of what is our generating of electricity and non-emitting forces. And we're seeing really strong growth. Uh, there's small numbers at the moment, but high growth in, in provinces like Alberta and the prairies in terms of putting in uh, wind and solar capabilities. And as Robert also mentioned, we're seeing this drive into the home and people figuring out how they have uh, either renewables or on-site storage at their home for re resiliency. And this is creating a, a huge dynamic. Um, it's creating a huge demand for installers. And some of this is also creating a, a lot of demand to have our workforce more distributed uh, across Canada versus you know, traditional kind of uh, base load generating stations where you have a focused workforce. Uh, this is really going to be with these distributed energy resources, a need for a workforce that is well distributed across the country. Yeah, well, it's good to hear you're on the same page from your different vantage points. And we'll go more into the needs, the skills, sort of the how to uh, in, in the next uh, chapters, uh, if I can put it this way. Um, Kevin, what does this all mean uh, for um, sort of, um, you know, how we must approach teaching electrical disciplines, um, you know, how we must basically prepare uh, our uh, future workers and leaders uh, for this, you know, disruption? Yeah, thanks, Flo. Uh, great, great question. And my, my panelists, colleagues have hit on some wonderful changes uh, in terms of the sector and where we're going with innovation and in many ways disruption. And so that creates a challenge and an opportunity for post-secondary education. I think it's important to note that across the spectrum of post-secondary, we're training in all facets uh, to support the electricity industry. So it, it could be through apprenticeship and skilled trades or through technicians, technologists, uh, engineers, but it's also in, in areas that are not directly uh, related to the grid or to the distribution system, but it could be in new areas like big data analytics or artificial intelligence, finance, business, HR, et cetera. Um, so, you know, to keep up with the pace of change is definitely a challenge. And we can only do so with conversation with the sector, with our employers, with associations. We need to make sure that we're always staying at, at the pace of change. Certainly the pandemic has created a whole different environment for learning. And we've done so remotely. Uh, we've been able to leverage new technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, things like simulation, where we can integrate new technologies and new innovations into the learning experience in, a, in an easier way than perhaps we were able to do so before. So I see us on a, a cusp of a great opportunity to ensure that we're integrating some of these new innovations. And certainly we have to shift some of the programming. The foundational knowledge we know is important. We know it's important we teach students to adapt, to enhance their professional skills and to be prepared for a lifelong learning journey because that's what it's gonna take in, in all sectors, but in particular this sector, which is ever evolving and changing. So with modernization of the grid, electrification, green energy, lots of opportunity. We need to adapt, be nimble, and we need to listen, quite frankly, to our employers and, and what they're asking us to provide our students and to help those employers as well with upskilling and reskilling of their current labor force 
to stay abreast of all these changes. Yeah, so lots of collaboration opportunities for sure and what you all have described, frankly, and this is probably why we have the three of you on a, on a call like this, on a, on a panel to share your unique vantage points and to try to create those, those connections. Great, well, we'll be moving to our uh, second topic today. So Canada's current electricity workforce. Uh, of course, if we want to know where we want to go or what's ahead, it's also good to sort of take stock of, of where we are at today. And I'm going to ask Roberta uh, to give us a sense of the demographics of Canada's current electricity workforce uh, and what that implies for future workforce needs. Well, although um, we observed like the vast majority of the workforce in this industry is middle age and, and male with a, a fair mix of ethnicity and um, closeness to a typical retirement age. Uh, we're experiencing a growth in uh, women and youth joining in the skilled trades and, and seeing that retirement age become a moving target. So changes to the pension rules, for example, are also um, prolonging the wholesale retirement of the current workforce. But Naturally, we're seeing the next generation join in the industry and they tend to have different social attitudes and educational backgrounds than the current workforce. So they bring new ideas and approaches to the tasks and um, many companies are recognizing this and having to find ways to match the jobs to the skill sets by changing the way they operate in order in order to capitalize on this group. Um, we're seeing the need for flexibility in what constitutes the normal workday. This means we're seeing more shift work and compressed work weeks. Um, this can often give better coverage for the company but definitely impacts the um, work-life balance for some people. Uh, and actually, we're hearing that the younger workforce prefers this model. Those with family commitments, they like the ability to schedule events outside of evenings and weekends. So it seems the changing landscape of the work environment actually matches the up and coming workforce. Um, unfortunately, though, from a union point of view, we're seeing a mix of temporary, part-time, and full-time workers due to economic issues. And so this means um, we'll see less of a more traditional worker in the sector for the time being, but we really hope that um, it'll change soon back to the normal, what we call normal jobscape. Well, I think most of us would agree. We certainly hope to get back to some sense of normality, whether in the electricity sector or, or, or beyond. Um, so, um, Adrian, uh, Kevin was saying that it's important for academia to listen to industry and what they need. And, and, and of course, that, that, that I'm sure is certainly true. Um, you, the question to you would be, does the Canadian electricity workforce um, have the skills needed for the transformation that is happening in the electricity sector, uh, both in terms of new technologies and green or electrification uh, and, and transition, let's say, um, areas? Yeah, I, I, this is a difficult answer. I think I'm gonna have to say yes and no. Um, as I mentioned before, I you know the growth in this sector is just phenomenal. And for the last 10 years, we've continued to see shortages of certain skilled workers, such as in industrial electricians. So I think we need more of some of the traditional skills, no matter what. And, and then we need to uh, look at what other skills are now coming in with these new technologies. Um, I, I like the comment from Kevin. I think we believe there was a, a quote I, I you know, steal from Dr. Ball at Ryerson University, which says industry led, uh, academia driven. So this partnership between what is happening in the industry and how do we couple that um, with academic institutions so that the workforce coming out is understanding what some of the new technology is, but also having the ability for industry to work back with schools to update and upskill some of the workers that they have so they can also catch up to some of this evolving technology. So I think it's important that uh, everyone in the workforce becomes digital, digitally literate. So everything nowadays is connected to something, has some digital interface. And so that is gonna become a standard as we go forward, but it's also gonna create new um, other skill sets, which we haven't traditionally hired into this, like cybersecurity. It's typically have been left to the IT groups. We're going to have to attract that skill set into the electricity group 
data scientists, as I mentioned, engineers. And I think there should be a big push on technicians. I, I think um, there's a huge opportunity to have more technicians in, in the workspace because there will just be a phenomenal amount of technology out there that needs to be installed and served. Yeah. Anytime I hear about skills shortages or, you know, any kind of workforce shortages, I also think this is a great opportunity. I mean, especially right now when unemployment is granted, maybe not as high as it was uh, half a year ago, but still above average, let's say. Uh, and there are legitimate concerns about employment in the future, especially when we talk about, um, you know, automation and, and things like that. Uh, clearly, there are areas of the Canadian economy where there are job opportunities and there will be in the future. So that's really interesting. And I guess that's a good segue to turn to Kevin and ask you basically, uh, first, if you want to react to any of what Adrian said, uh, but also looking at the recent cohorts graduating from Canadian universities and colleges, uh, are they effectively prepared for a future in the electricity sector in your view? And if not, what must be done? Yeah, great, great question. Let me start by uh, just agreeing with, uh, with Adrian's comments. And in some ways, uh, to borrow his answer, <laughs> I, th I think the answer is both yes and no. I, I really think in terms of some of the, the more traditional uh, fields uh, in post-secondary that lead to employment in the electricity sector, um, th those programs that have been around that have worked closely with industry, I, yes, I, I, I fully believe uh, they're preparing cohorts. They're ready to work in the industry now. And and certainly, you know, they'll have to evolve and change as industry changes. And, you know, for, for any uh, college and university, I think what's really important is aside from the vocational knowledge and that understanding how to learn and in many ways unlearn, it's, it's also building that adaptability and that thirst for knowledge in a lifelong learning model. That's going to be absolutely critical. But in some of the other fields that Adrian mentioned that are that are newer, where there's there's uh, a, you know kind of a, an intersection of some newer technical skills coming into the electricity sector, uh, there there's a great opportunity there. There there perhaps are not uh, enough graduates, and perhaps the graduates that are coming out in some of those areas aren't uh, aren't fully up to speed in terms of shifting to the electricity sector and. And so that's, again, a great opportunity for us to work together. Uh, but I think it's, it's where we're going in, in as the sector is we'll still have the need for apprenticeship training for technicians, technologists, uh, for engineers, for those, those core vocations uh, that have, have always been uh, so relevant in the electricity sector. The question now is how do we change and adapt over time? And as Adrian said, how do we help current employees upskill and perhaps learn some new knowledge and new competencies to help them shift and adapt and, and make sure that they stay relevant as the sector evolves? And that's where I think there's a great opportunity for micro-credentials working in collaboration with employers and post-secondary uh, sector to build these short-term, very focused competency-based training that can take individual roles in the sector and shift them along a continuum so that nobody is left behind as the sector evolves and changes. And so that's what I think must be done. I, I think it's a constant evolution of curriculum. It's a constant evolution in the classroom. It's making sure that we're embedding work integrated learning into our programs, which, which helps our students get out into industry and they bring that knowledge back. So that makes programs better and it also ensures our graduates are work ready and job ready. So thanks, Kevin. Great to see there's some agreement here. Um, I'm going to stick with you as we transition to topic three for today, and that's Canada's future electricity workforce training and attracting new workers. So, uh, Kevin, what are academic institutions doing to prepare future electrical workers and how must programs change to adapt to the needs of the industry? Yeah, thanks for both of those questions. Well, there's there's lots to be done for sure. As as the industry continues to change and evolve, uh, curriculum has to change and adapt, and and that that does become a, a somewhat of a challenge to do it in a in a nimble and agile way, and and also make sure that we're addressing the needs of a multitude of employers. So if you take just a segment 
uh, a, an academic program, let's just use the, the technician or technologist program. We're producing graduates to work in a variety of fields uh, within the larger electricity sector. And one of the challenges is always is to meet all the demands that employers may have on those graduates. So I think what's it's incumbent on the post-secondary institutions to, to weed through some of that and get to, to some of those core foundational pieces and then, and then allow students the, the um, ability to, to venture off in their learning and leverage things like capstone projects and research projects to explore individual areas of the industry that are of interest to them. Um, but we have to be able to, to maintain a, a base level of knowledge to make sure all our graduates are coming out uh, ready to go in the industry and, and have those, those requisite skills to de further develop and evolve. So that's certainly uh, one piece of preparing. Yeah, so as to the, the second part of the question as to how programs must change, uh, that's a constant evolution. And, and certainly we're gonna need new programs we're going to have to change curriculum within existing programs. And, and as we drive to new uh, areas of innovation, certainly when you look at green energy, electrification, modernization of the grid, these are all elements that will need to find their way into existing programs. But I anticipate there'll be offshoots of new programs as those areas become more focused and specialized. And so that's just a constant evolution within the post-secondary uh, area. Uh, for us, I can speak to Georgian's example as a community college. We have program advisory committees. These are members from industry that give us feedback regularly on our curriculum uh, within the programs, on the type of equipment, on the type of competencies and outcomes that we're teaching to. And they help us evolve and make sure that those graduates are job ready. Uh, the other thing we do is we're, we're very engaged, as are most post-secondary institutions, in outreach activities. So events like FIRST Robotics, Women in STEM, Engineering Races, I think these are also fundamentally important because we can have post-secondary programs, but if we're not encouraging the youth to explore the opportunities to take those academic programs and then become part of the sector, uh, then we're still gonna lose ground. And so I think it's really important that we look at this holistically working together to encourage the youth to enter STEM fields, uh, to ensure post-secondary have relevant programming, up-to-date curriculum, and are looking for new areas of opportunity and innovation to support the sector. And, and we do that by working very closely with industry partners. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so now we're gonna get a little bit more, let's say nuts and bolts, a little bit more practical maybe, uh, or actionable from, from here on. Um, so, um, Adrian, um, what would you say are the top disciplines that will be required in Canada's future electricity workforce and what skills is the industry in need of? If you can be a little bit specific, sure. that would be great. I, I'll, I'll be specific and maybe I'll turn it around on you a little bit, Flo, as well. So, you know, certainly when we look at uh, things like electrical engineering, um, the Red Seal trades, things like that, I, I think those are an absolute must and we continue to see shortages of those. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, um, cybersecurity is no longer just an IT field that's needed for us to ensure the security of our electricity and to, of our grid, uh, data scientists, technicians. And, and where I wanted to flip this around flow is that with, with this new ecosystem, I think the other thing we have to think about is you know, finance and legal and HR, and how do we really bring those um, groups of, of professionals up to speed on what's happening and what the transition is in the energy landscape. So there's new uh, financing models for putting in microgrids. There are uh, new legal issues in this you know kind of prosumer world where we're producing consuming electricity back and forth. So each of those <coughs> uh, areas of, of study also need to start to learn what is happening in the energy transition. So I think this um, broadening of, of some of these fields to really understand uh, what's happening in this industry is going to be critical for us to move forward um, in addition to the, the, the hard skills or the technical skills, which I mentioned earlier. 
Thanks, Adrian. You can uh, you can switch the switch things around on me anytime you want, as long as it's again supportive of this great conversation we're having. Uh, as we did with the first question, I'm going to turn to Roberta and ask you maybe the same question: What are the top disciplines that will be required in Canada's future electricity workforce, uh, and what skills do you feel industry is in need? Again, looking at it from your uh, unique vantage point. Well, sure, Flo. I mean, changes in technology uh, influence the industry, and that directly influences the type of workforce required. So I think Adrian had said it, since infrastructure is the foundation of this industry, electricians, linemen, engineers will always be needed, um, technologists and technicians, data scientists, IT specialists, and, and workers with experience in solar power, uh, wind generation, and other renewable energies definitely float to the surface when talking about required disciplines. Occupational health and safety, as well as environmental science uh, fields are becoming really strong focuses too. But of course, near and dear to my heart, uh, the trade work combined with uh, science and, and the IT skills, uh, cybersecurity is a huge one when we're talking about the electrical grid. You know, um, that's going to be the most required educational needs and, and experience going forward. So the, the specific skill set would, you know, definitely be trade work and, and sciences. But I do agree with Adrian uh, about the legal issues. We, we see a lot of regulatory changes. I love your term prosumer. I'm going to use that. That's great. But, you know, we'll see some traditional uh, requirements, but also some newer and uh, different ways to, to think about um, how to put people into the workforce and address the, the new um, needs of environmental concerns and that sort of thing. I'm going to stay with you, Roberta. Um, there is a sort of um, a challenge, I suppose, that the electricity and, and the broader energy industry face, and probably other industries too, to be honest, around um, sort of branding, around sort of people's perceptions of what it is like to work in their industry. Uh, and so I'm wondering uh, what you think the industry, the electricity industry in this case, can do to attract Canada's youth and other workers from similar industries, uh, including energy, to bring skilled workers in? Well, again, remote work possibilities where, you know, where needed, uh, work week flexibility, creative benefit packages, that's a new one that really, um, it's a softer, softer cost than wages, I would say. And, you know, you may or may not agree with me on that one, uh, Adrian, but, um, that seems to be the top of mind for today's youth and uh, young families. And I didn't mean anything, you know, negative about that. But, you know, when we're negotiating with the, the companies that we deal with, um, the bottom line, you know, we usually look at wages. But we're trying to rethink how we can um, compensate and still have a, you know, a viable company. Because if the company is not viable, then of course the union's not viable. So just a tangent there. But to attract the skilled workers from similar industries, I think there needs to be some sort of um, job security or, or viable compensation, right? This is something that we're seeing a, a steady decay and, and move from. Um, employees are becoming contract workers. And, and depending on age, uh, job security might actually be the runner-up to compensation. Uh, unions play a big part uh, in a lot of um, tangibles for workers in this industry, just historically. So in cases where the industry is partnered with the union, from my experience, they generally see a greater number of applicants for any given job. You know, we'll, we just see better packages overall. So that's my take on it. Adrian, you were uh, very gently and politely called out, so I just want to give you an opportunity to react if you want. No, I, I, I think Roberta brings up some good points. Um, certainly the, the way to approach the workforce is shifting. Uh, at Schneider, we call this the new ways of working. <clears throat> There's a couple points in there that I, I think I'd want to touch on. So um, one thing that we've launched recently at Schneider is something we call a recharge break. So this gives employees the opportunity to schedule some un, unpaid time off, um, you know, particularly for, for new families and younger workers where, you know, the, the vacation time is, is, is not as much as it is. 
or in times like like we're living now where you, you know it seems like we're connected 24 7 and you just need some some time off and i think it's innovating new benefits like that which are going to be attractive um, we've um, launched a, a global family medical leave act to extend parental leave I think this is key in terms of getting more women into the workforce because still today they tend to be the primary caregiver at home. So the more that we can bring that flexibility, the more we can actually bring that um, uh, the the women into the workforce. And um, you know, and then in terms of just attracting, you know, there was an article in Forbes not too long ago about millennials not wanting to work for a company where they don't buy into their corporate sustainable. Um, uh, and uh, corporate social responsibility uh, platform. And, you know, all of us in the electricity industry right now have a, have a huge value proposition because what we're doing as we're electrifying at the same process, uh, we're decarbonizing. This is a, it's a fantastic um, opportunity for people to get into a, a sustainable business at, at the outset. So I think we have uh, certainly are undergoing a shift away from you know, the wage to a more holistic view. So um, uh, I, 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 you know, I think there's different ways of approaching that. And Roberta mentioned a few, and I think we're trying to look at a, at a few solutions as well. Very, very interesting. I like that idea as well of, you know, not looking just at the wage. Of course, the wage is for anyone the most important, uh, all of us included on this call. But at the same time, um, yeah, it's true that there's maybe a more holistic uh, view Kevin, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just to just to add to those comments, I, I think they're uh, they're terrific in in the sense that you know creating that more inclusive, flexible workforce also is is a real advantage to uh, when we're talking about training workers uh, for this sector because um, ultimately, when when uh, students, prospective students, are looking at their opportunities. They are looking at the big picture. They're looking at the sector, the type of industry. They're looking at things from compensation to flexibility. We know that um, millennials uh, are are looking at job prospects differently. And so for us to fill some of those shortages that we're experiencing in the sector, I think we really do need that that holistic approach. So I just I applaud uh, the the work that uh is happening at uh, Snyder that Adrian talked about. I think that could go a long way to supporting, uh, and I know certainly more companies are doing like things that will support more students coming into post-secondary looking at those opportunities. Roberta, do you have anything else to add? Because this kind of started with you and I just want to make sure you have an opportunity to add anything if you can keep it uh, short. No, I think I'm, I'm good, thanks. All right, great. Well, this is exactly the kind of conversation we like to have. So thank you for uh, you know keeping it, uh, keeping it real, I guess, uh, maybe the new generation would say. Um, so I'm gonna ask you um, all three to uh, address the issue of training and retraining workers and really what industry can do uh, in terms of rescaling, upscaling, uh, in Canada's electricity sector. Who wants to maybe go at it first and give us a, if possible, a sort of one minute answer on that? I, I can try and take that one first. Um, so from, from, from my perspective at, at Schneider, I think uh, certainly technology is moving fast. I think that's something that, you know, every year uh, there's, there's newer technology coming out and you know, I think it's difficult. So we get a, a, a group of fresh grads and, and they're, they're up to speed, but that only apply for the next three to five years, and we have to figure out ways to retrain them. Kevin mentioned something earlier, these micro certifications. I think that would be extremely useful for industry to know that people have been updated or have a current uh, certificate. Um, and then internally, you know, we're, we're constantly um, doing a lot of digital training, and the benefit of that is that uh, people can, can do it asynchronously. So rather than taking a a full week off to go attend a course, you can you can piecemeal that out over the course of a month. So I think the more that we have the opportunity for people in the workforce to stay current without having to leave the workforce is is really vital and critical. And this is where potentially these micro certifications can help. Very interesting. Who wants to go next? I'm happy to. Oh. Go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> Oh, okay. 
Thanks. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet, but, uh, you know, industry needs to really be able to train uh, the workers in a more timely manner than what we're seeing now. We're seeing a lot of training dollars being cut, you know, with a lot of companies. And that's a bit short-sighted in my opinion, because uh, as Adrian again said, three years, kind of the best before date for some training in this industry, things are moving so fast with technology that you, you need something more timely and uh, tangible and, and transferable. Because again, with millennials, they're not going to be working at the same company for 35 years, I think, like uh, the generation maybe before us, but they move around a lot more. So, you know, it, I think that's going to be something that we have to realize is going to happen, that the skill set needs to be more standardized and transferable. Um, we need subject matter experts and uh, various platforms for communing, communicating the training, We've learned that over this last year with remote work and remote training and remote conferences. And so that's another thing that needs to be robust. We need to have that type of training available and um, allow the worker to come out with an actual skill set. You know, the, the beauty about apprenticeships is that you have in school training and then you have on the job training. So it's a blend. You get those skills um, online perhaps or in a classroom and then you can hone them in real life so uh, that's something that I think we need to continue um, having is um, apprenticeships. Reskilling and, and upskilling definitely save costs for the industry if you can keep the employees who are already familiar with your company I think that enhances the value of that employee and I think you'd see a return in efficiency and, and maybe even a return in, in loyalty and commitment to um, keeping the company going and strong and viable. So, Thank you very much, Roberta. Kevin, I saw you nodding along to both Adrian and, and Roberta. Give us your unique academic lens on that same problem or that same opportunity, of course, as well. Yeah, I, I, I uh, thank you, Flo. And I, and I would say opportunity. I, I really think it is. I, I, you know, it is important, certainly. We've talked about you know, the, the, the fundamental programs, if you will, uh, whether it be uh, you know, business, HR, finance, we talked about some, some new areas of legal, uh, you know, electrician, technician, technologist, engineer, et cetera. So those are, those are programs that are designed as Adrian and uh, Roberta both said that graduates come out and they're, they're relevant, uh, but that, that has a, a time, a shelf life to it, sorry. And so we need to consider as a sector how we can continually upskill and retrain as necessary. Because I think ultimately when we talk about attracting individuals into the sector, those are opportunities that, that they're gonna look for. What are my opportunities to upskill, reskill, to stay relevant uh, in an ever-changing sector? So I think that becomes a, a, an imperative. Um, just going back to the, the micro-credential or micro-certification discussion, I think there's a great opportunity for the sector at large because the, the more refined we can articulate the competencies and build some of those micro certifications that allow uh, current employees to upskill and do so across perhaps the whole pan-Canadian landscape, uh, the greater value add to the training, uh, the training body as well as to those participants. Um, I'll just give you an example because I've been very close to this at, at Georgian. We, we partner with several uh, large companies. Uh, a couple of them are in the electricity sector uh, and a couple others in the manufacturing sector, certainly involved a little bit more on the, the electrification side. And, and part of our partnership with those employers is looking at post-secondary curriculum and programming, but it's also working with them to actually upskill and reskill their current workforce. And we do that with some hard technical skills, whether it be something like uh, protection and control, but we also do it with leadership skills. Uh, Post-secondary institutions are well equipped to handle continuing education and ongoing training opportunities. And, and there, so I urge all our employers certainly listening to reach out to your local post-secondary institution, uh, create those connections, because I think that's where there can be a real win-win and some of those competencies and skills that are then taught to those employees in the sector can then be brought 
into the post-secondary program so that the next round of graduates already has that extra level of skill and competency as, as they enter the workforce. Wow, there's so much in what all of th the three of you are sharing. I could ask you questions all day, but we're going to be moving to uh, to topic four, uh, which is national strategies for adapting the workforce to the future. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the only way we can do it. Maybe, maybe we could try the other way around uh, more seriously. I want to ask you very concretely, um, and I'm going to start with Roberta. What kind of partnerships can be formed or must be formed uh, to effectively prepare the future electricity workforce uh, in Canada? So, as I mentioned earlier, um, unions, of course, play a big part in providing job security and, and competitive pay for workers. My experience is that companies generally see a greater number of applicants for jobs when they partner with unions. Uh, national standards for the electricity industry will go a long way to help the workforce adapt for the future. So partnering with the standards bodies um, and industry training centers will ensure a well-trained and diverse workforce. And of course, partnering with post-secondary institutions for recruitment and, and um, providing input into the programs um, is you know, another really great avenue. Great. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Kevin for that same question. Yeah, I, I, I know I've said this a few times already, so <laughs> apologies for the uh, repeating it. But I, I really do think those partnerships between industry and, and academia are, are absolutely critical. Uh, Roberta uh, hit on this as well, to, to work with uh, union partners, to work with employers, to work with um, organizations, whether it be the national standards bodies, whether it's Electricity Human Resources Canada, uh, Ontario. In Ontario, for us, we work with the Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists. There's lots of opportunity for collaboration. And, and I just wanna go back to something Roberta said, to have that, uh, that national standard is, is so critical. For us to align against occupational standards, to align against competency profiles, and to make sure that what we're doing in training future workforce and employees aligns with the needs of industry. And there's an agreement on what those uh, job competencies look like. And so we can align on the training of that. that that's just going to further our efforts. And it makes sure that as a, as a system, as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. that we have the right return on investment. And we're also building... Uh, mobility and portability. So if we can be teaching those transferable skills, but we all understand what it means to be a, a solar panel installer, for example, and that individual, if they're trained in Manitoba, can find employment in Alberta or any of the other provinces is so critical, I believe, if, if we're going to partner and do this effectively. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, at, at the local level or the regional level, uh, I think it's so uh, important to, to have connections with, uh, with post-secondary uh, institutions, whether it's apprenticeship training or uh, diploma or degree programs, and, and engage. Um, hire co-op students, hire interns, provide projects for capstones, um, partner on applied research projects with your, your local post-secondary institutions. All those connection points help build the profile of the industry and they help expose students to the opportunity as well as the challenges. And, and that's really what excites students when they're looking for graduate opportunities. How can they make a difference? And I think we all have a role to play to, to give them a lens into that world. Speaking of exciting uh, the youth basically and uh, the future workers, whether in the trades or some of the digital um, sort of um, areas that uh, we talked about uh, or, or simply as, as leaders, um, what role does communication uh, or telling the electricity story play in attracting the next generation of workers to the industry? And should this be done at a national level? I'm going to turn to Adrian. Sure. I, I think, um, you know, as, as I started my career, that was many, many years ago. But 
Um, when I went into the electricity industry, it was a dangerous industry that dealt with gray boxes that were in basements or in electrical closets. Not very exciting. Um, today, we're, we're really at the forefront of a techno technological shift. We're at the forefront of bringing sustainability to our country. So this paradigm shift really needs to, to happen in terms of how we communicate to people about what our industry is all about and, and what we are doing. Um, so certainly that needs to be done. It needs to be done broad scale. And um, there's a huge opportunity for us to attract all sorts of um, different people into our industry that perhaps when, when they were graduating or as perhaps they're, they're looking forward to, to decide what to study or what to focus on or what trade to go into, this is a really exciting, exciting time. And we, we know there's certainly a tremendous amount of opportunity here. So it's going to be growing. So we need the workforce. So besides all that good stuff, there's a, a huge opportunity to to make a, a living wage and have a career. So I, I certainly think we need to make that shift. Well, hopefully this conversation can contribute to that. And hopefully the youth will be watching and listening and, and taking notes because there's some, some great insights and, and sort of recommendations as to how they can prepare as well how they can, um, you know, position themselves, I guess, to, uh, to apprehend what, what's coming. Um, would anyone else like to add to that topic of communications and telling the story of the electricity sector before we move to our calls to action? Yeah, I, thanks, Flo. I just, you know, I think it's important for people to realize um, how much of our lives depend on the electricity industry. I mean, if, it, if that grid shut down, like, uh, our lives would stop moving. And um, so the potential of this industry is huge. And so uh, I, I agree with what Adrian said here. I mean, a, a national story is, is fantastic. We need to have um, everybody moving in the same direction, I think, coast to coast. And, you know, if we have a message that it's national and, it's, and if it's relatable, uh, it might just do the trick to um, attract the next generation of workers to the, to the already thousands of workers in this sector. Well, what's certain is that without electricity, this call would be uh, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> a black black screen, maybe. Uh, Kevin, would you like to add something? Yeah, just to, just to add that I think it's really important we we share that story. And, um, you know, Roberta and Adrian have have absolutely uh, nailed it, in my opinion, about the the multitude of ways that electricity impacts our lives. But I do think there is an opportunity. I, I don't. I don't think we're, we're sharing that story to the best of our collective ability yet with particularly the youth. When, when I look to this industry and you think of all of the different layers to the industry, and, and I've learned more again today just from Adrian and Roberta about some of the opportunity, there's, there's not many ind uh, industries that can promise this kind of growth change, progress, opportunity for advancement, um, I, I mean, this is an industry that will continue uh, to develop and grow and has such an impact on our lives that I, I think we, we do need to tell the multitude of stories because there are some myths out there. there there's some legends that uh, perhaps were accurate 15, 20 years ago and are no longer today. And, and so we've got so we have some work to do uh, to break down some of those uh, some of those myths. Well, and I think we're, we're doing that as we speak. At least the three of you certainly are, are sharing some, some great insights uh, into, um, into the way forward. So this is really the favorite part, at least uh, for me. And uh, I think uh, for our audience, it often is, you know, basically the opportunity to hear you deliver a pitch in sort of 30 seconds, maximum a minute, um, you know. And the question is ultimately, what must be done now and by who to best prepare and adapt our current electricity workforce for those opportunities, those challenges, this disruption, this progress uh, that is uh, ahead of us. So who would like to start with a, with a short pitch uh, to our audience or frankly, to something sp someone specifically or a group as you like? No one wants to go first. I'm going to have to choose. 
I'm going to have to choose. Adrian, you're, you're the one with the biggest smile right now. So I'm, I'm going to go on that basis. <laughs> the smile always gets me in trouble. So, um, look, I, I think that we've talked um, during this session how exciting the electricity uh, industry is right now as we're going through this transition and, it, and how it's evolving to be a very high tech, uh, very motivated industry around sustainability. But we also talked a lot about having a shortage, shortage of labor, shortage of a skill set. So to me, the most effective thing we need to do is engage more people into our workforce. And the number one thing we can do is to find ways to engage more women in the electricity industry. This is the fastest way to double the population that we have. And, and it's, a, it's a great and exciting career. So whatever we can do, whether it's engagement through STEM or other programs, I would encourage everyone listening to find a way that we can encourage more women to enter the electricity market. I love a pitch which is so clear and in, in essence so simple as well. And it's of course also great to hear a man uh, say this, it probably could happen more often. Um, Roberta, I see you nodding, so I'm gonna go with you for the next one. Um, 30 seconds or not too much more, please. I'm not sure how to even follow that, Adrian. Thank you. Um, you know, a continued focus on the improvement of environmental, economic, and social impacts of the electricity industry and uh, partnerships with, you know, various companies, uh, the unions, standards bodies, government, and um, educational institutes is necessary and the way to go to promote and grow and sustain uh, this sector overall. So. You know, if you care about any of those things, I think this is a good industry for you to get into and, and make a difference in. Thank you. Nice and short and also very clear. Uh, Kevin, last but not least, uh, what is your pitch or your call to action in 30 seconds or a little bit more? Yeah, my, my call is really to the, the industry at large. And, and for those that um, are active in supporting uh, programs and student learning. Uh, thank you. For those that could become more active, we invite you to the table. We think there's tremendous opportunity. If you can help us better understand the workforce needs, the training expectations, where, where things are moving with the job, with technology and understanding the future of the industry, the better we can align as post-secondary institutions to meet those needs. And just to build on Adrian's comment, there's a lot we can do in partnership to look towards underrepresented groups, uh, both in post-secondary as well as in the labor force, uh, to, to do a lot together to bring individuals into those areas that right now, for, for many reasons, are not attracted to them. And, and so we're, that's where an opportunity exists for us to work together. So thank you very much to our three panelists today. Uh, you've shared some great insights with us. Uh, Adrian Thomas, country president with Schneider Electric. Kevin Weaver, vice president academic with Georgian College. And Roberta Haikawi, assistant business manager at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I of course also wanna share uh, and thank, sorry, our sponsor, that's EHRC Electricity, Human Resources Canada. Uh, if you're not familiar or if you want to learn more, visit their website at electricityhr.ca. That's electricityhr.ca. And more generally, if you're interested in this topic of electricity, of transformation, of Canada's future economy, uh, make sure to visit thefutureeconomy.ca. That's our platform, of course. Uh, you can also check out the rest of this series called Powering Canada's Future. Uh, on the website uh, and uh, you will find interviews with Michelle Branigan of EHRC, Ken Hartwick of OPG, Ontario Power Generation that is, Kathy McCrum of Sask Power and Najla Rauf of uh, Spark Power. And of course you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube to not miss any of our videos or any of our content on Canada's future economy. Thank you all again very much for watching. Stay well and see you next time.